everyone, and uh, welcome to the Geomet Research Seminar Series. As most of you will know, I'm Karma Jorgensen, and I'm the Director of Research Development and Environment in the School, and it is my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce Paul Bowman, Dr. Paul Bowman, um, who many of you will know as the Director of Postgraduate Research in the School, and many of you will also know as the world leading expert on martial arts. Um, and um, he's actually just uh, published martial arts studies, <coughs> multidisciplinary boundaries. He's also the founder and director of the HSC funded martial arts studies research network, and he's a co editor of the Open Access Online Journal Martial Arts Studies. So he is a whole martial arts empire in, put into one man. Um, and today um, he is going to uh, be talking about this project of the emergent interdisciplinary field of martial arts studies. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, so the subtitle changed a bit when I actually when I actually wrote it. Um, this is called Making Martial Arts Studies, and it's now about two books, the tale of two books. Um, the first section is called How to Kick a Samurai Off His Horse. The topics of history, tradition, and authenticity in Asian martial arts are some of the most conflicted that I know. A handful of scholars have offered well-researched martial arts histories which challenge what are often quite obviously preposterous myths. Yet even the most outrageous and ludicrous of the myths about martial arts history seem tenacious. Articles and books continue to be published that trade entirely in myths and legends, snake oil and sorcery, presenting them as if they're history. However, with the recent increase in scholarly attention to martial arts, plus the emergence of a field of martial arts studies itself, combined with the movement of peer-reviewed publications into the open access realm, one has to ask whether smoke and mirrors martial arts histories have a future. Unfortunately, pseudo-histories can hardly be expected to vanish in a puff of smoke. This is not least um, because behind the books are interests, investments, institutions, types of desire, and indeed types of authority that are deep-rooted. There are many examples of spurious histories and invented authenticities that we could discuss. But today I want to consider one of the most stark cases. Hopefully there's no sound. Um, a martial art which is structured by an antagonism between on the one hand, an entirely fabricated, invented, ancient history, and on the other hand, a growing body of academic studies that reveal its actual history to be little more than 60 years. This is the case of the Korean martial art and national sport, Taekwondo. As with so many martial arts, the history of Taekwondo is presented as ancient, indigenous, ethnic, autochthonous, and independent, but increasingly, Historians of the art show that Taekwondo cannot be said to have existed before the end of the Second World War. Indeed, it was elaborated primarily according to a nationalist and anti-Japanese post-war agenda. Ironically, though, it was constructed from ingredients found almost exclusively in the Japanese art of Shotokan Karate. Moreover, Taekwondo's status as an ideological part of Korea's de-Japanification is well documented saw its founders' efforts to invent a history for it. Their project included first trying to persuade martial arts teachers in Korea to use their new name, Taekwondo. Second, coming up with a spurious etymology for the made-up characters of the new name. And third, claiming that it had an unbroken connection with ancient legendary warrior kingdoms, folk traditions, indigenous sports, and heroic battles against invaders. In this narrative, the Japanese origins of Taekwondo are erased, and Japan only features as the stooge within preposterous scenarios, such as the one in which Taekwondo is said to have developed its high jumping kicks in order to kick samurais from their horses. As one martial arts writer put it, you only have to have seen a horse, never mind someone sitting on it, never mind a warrior on a war horse, to realize that this idea is ridiculous. Um, anyway, whether ancient or modern, it is rather tellingly only since the 1950s and 1960s that Taekwondo began to spread around the world. However, it soon became one of the most popular martial arts and martial sports internationally. One Taekwondo institution, the WTF, based in South Korea, 
became an Olympic sport. Another institution, the ITF, based in North Korea, perhaps unsurprisingly presents itself as a lethal, pure, authentic killing art. In both incarnations, Taekwondo has historical and nationalistic myth stitched through all of its elements. Um, its patterns, or kata, which is what they are, are named after and are given interpretations that relate to the ancient kingdoms of Korea, and there are the ancient kingdoms of Korea, and students the world over must learn these names and these interpretations to pass their gradings. The inventors of modern Taekwondo are presented as merely the modern masters, merely the modern links in a very old lineage that comes down to us, unbroken through the ages. Given that this is in the syllabus, it's hardly surprising that practitioners of Taekwondo believe all sorts of crazy things about its history. But in this regard, of course, Taekwondo is far from unique. Practitioners of all traditional martial arts from wherever tend to believe in equivalent versions of magnificent histories. But what about the scholars, the academics, and the historians? Unsurprisingly, um, even for many of these, the matter of history in martial arts remains so freighted and weighted down by popular myths that even much that passes for scholarship refuses to face up to some fairly glaring facts, which, are basic, which basically insist that often martial arts, martial arts that present themselves as ancient are hardly even old, and that so many massive social mutations occurred through the 19th and 20th centuries that most traditional martial arts effectively have, um, at best, little more than a century, sometimes a lot less, of continuous history to them, rather than the vast aeons of allochronic time that we want them to expand. But scholarship is increasingly waking up to the inventedness of many traditions. Accordingly, there are disjunctions and antagonisms between much popular knowledge, uh, much supposed scholarship, and emergent academic knowledge, or between, so to speak, two types of groups. <coughs> um, now, in my abstract for this paper, I suggested that one question to be asked is what the emergent field of martial arts studies might do with this different kind of knowledge, ideological and mystical on the one hand, versus verifiable and somewhat more prosaic on the other. But perhaps a prior consideration would be what each of these kinds of knowledge does. My contention is that the orientation of martial arts studies should not simply involve the, the perpetuation of trade in stereotypes, myths and ideologies, of course. But equally, it should not just boil down to the making of better or more correct knowledge. Rather, it should also involve what Stuart Hall called conjunctural analysis, which entails a thoroughgoing reflection on and study of the effects and the consequences of different kinds of knowledge as they circulate within different kinds of context and intervene in different kinds of ways. So there are clearly different kinds of contexts of and for historical knowledge. If we consider only Taekwondo and Korea, we can see immediately why a post-World War II Korea would want to distance itself from Japan, and why its military and other martial arts leaders might want to construct a new ancient history for themselves, free from Japan, and of course implicitly superior. We can also see immediately why, still in the terms of nationalism and Taekwondo, there were desires for the new invention to become a global sport. Taekwondo diplomacy is surely no bad thing. Reciprocally, the emergence of the contrary desire to remain free from the tarnish of sport and to claim a purely martial character also makes sense. So these are some um, Korean conscripts in the Japanese <coughs> military. In both contexts, we'll watch this one first. Um, in both contexts, it makes obvious sense to go on to build museums and institutes and exhibition centers to educate people about the art and its place within the culture. This is uh, a promotional video for what's called the Taekwondo one, which is a new mecca for Taekwondo that Samsung funded and they built in Muju, a ski resort in Korea. Um, uh, and it's a place that they've invited me to come to talk about Taekwondo. <laughs> So we shall see what happens, right? Um, send help if I'm not back. If you do that. Um, so, exhibition centres, museums to educate people about the art and its place within the culture, and to commission research to produce studies and books and television programmes and documentaries and websites and so on and so forth. It makes absolute sense for the new to become the ancient, 
to represent the country, to capture hearts and minds, to become the heritage with a centre, a mecca for tourist pilgrims like this one, with ambassadors and embassies and annexes and so on. In such context, there is no guarantee that academic knowledge production can or will proceed independently or free from, say, state, governmental, political, economic, or other kinds of coaxing and coercion if academia ever can stay free from these things. There are huge pressures and forces working on researchers in different places to conform to ideologies in all sorts of ways. For instance, in a study of uh, Tai Chi Chuan, um, Adam Frank points to the ways that Chinese academic studies in China of Tai Chi, Qigong, and Qi in general overwhelmingly tow an ideological line in terms of the ways that these subjects are approached, which questions are brought to bear on them, and what conclusions are reached. This may seem dispiriting. What does it say about the purity and integrity of honest scholarship, for instance? Whatever our answers, we have to concede that there is big business and big PR and great financial and ideological opportunities in nationalising martial arts along self-orientalising lines, as is clearly happening in such places as the PRC, Hong Kong and South Korea, among others. But what about other contexts? where martial arts are not nationalist ideological interests? What about closer to home? What about here? What is the situation with the Battle of the Books here? Let me bring it as close to home as I can. <clears throat> Earlier this year, I published a book called Martial Arts Studies, Disrupting Disciplinary Boundaries. Almost as soon as the book hit Amazon, I was alerted by a friend that someone on Facebook was laying into me and my book, me because of my book. His settings were public so anyone was able to see his posts, so I was able to read it. Initially I wasn't going to quote my, critic, um, my critic's words directly for all sorts of reasons, but I've checked again and the post is still there and the settings are still public and also this guy pops up on all sorts of chat rooms and forums and everything and says similar things. So the author is clearly happy for these words to be out in the public domain. I will, however, leave things anonymous because, as I hope will soon become apparent, my interest in less is, who is, is less in who is saying what to whom about what, and more in what is being said and why. So for better or worse, I quote. The next blow to authentic traditional martial arts will not come from the pop culture or the industry, but from pompous academics. Alongside many fine teachers who are pushing for real academic studies of the arts, there are now quite a few office nerds who have never punched a person in their lives, who wish to put martial arts under the microscope and examine them as if they were crystals in a tube. More and more do I see such people publishing scholarly articles in which they talk about everything somehow related to the martial arts besides all that matters. The martial arts offer these people simply obscure subjects of research, to which they can attach themselves to become academic experts and write their PhD thesis. One such person has just released a book called Martial Arts Studies, Disrupting Disciplinary Boundaries. What the fuck does that have to do with martial arts? Look at the book's description. The fr this is from the back of the book. The phrase martial arts studies is increasingly circulating as a term to describe a new field of interest, but many academic fields, including history, philosophy, anthropology, and area studies, already engage in, with martial arts in their own particular way. Therefore, is there really such a thing as a unique field of martial arts studies? Martial arts studies is the first book to engage directly with these questions. It assesses the multiplicity and heterogeneity of possible approaches to martial arts studies, exploring orientations and limitations of existing approaches. It makes a case for constructing the field of martial arts studies in terms of key coordinates from post-structuralism, cultural studies, media studies, and post-colonialism. By using these anti-disciplinary approaches to disrupt the approaches of other disciplines, martial arts studies proposes a field that both emerges out of and differs from its many disciplinary locations. What the heck does this even mean? Who cares? You know what the, that author wrote me when I offered he review my book as he presents himself as a martial arts expert? I will quote from his email. After he got a free copy, he wrote to me of the book. It's a bit outside of my areas overall. For me, that says everything 
of his level of expertise. Now I could tell you a lot about the chain of events here, but what I cut through all of that, maybe talk about it later. Aside from everything else that's going on, I want you to notice the bookishness of all of this. This is all about books. Yeah, we tend to think that martial arts are about training bodies into weapons, how to use weapons, how to deal with weapons, to withstand bodily weapons, or body callousing, as it has been called. But what we see in my anecdote is not a bodily battle. It is rather a battle over the book, and ultimately a dispute about authority, about kinds of authority. Each of us, my critic and myself, have a sense of what a good book is and what a, is a bad book, a right book and a wrong book, the problem is that faced with each other's books, we don't agree on which is which. As Jean-Francois Lyotard would have once said, there is a different between us, a fundamental difference of opinion as to what is right and what is wrong, and moreover a difference that cannot really be settled without some damage being done to one or both of the parties. If we side with me, we damage him. If we side with him, we damage me. If we compromise in some kind of halfway settlement, we damage both of us. This is part of what Leotard means by different. Noting this different recasts my critic's opening salvo. It no longer looks so much like pure hyperbole. It now looks surprisingly like he may have a point. From his perspective, on the one hand, there are martial arts experts who are good teachers and good scholars. Because of this, they are authorized to write what will therefore be good books. On the other hand, there are office nerds with no martial arts uh, mastery who are so ensnared in the academic machine that they can only write bad books. So this is a battle over the book, the determination of the proper book and the improper book. Behind the two books, two kinds of master. In the good corner, the true martial arts master with his true mastery. In the bad corner, the ignorant schoolmaster with his ignorant non-mastery. A non-mastery that abuses mastery and actually deals a blow to it. The inside of one realm is presented as the outside of the other, and the, ins the inside of martial arts mastery is outside academic mastery. The inside of academic mastery is outside martial arts mastery. My critic's solution to the different is uh, the production of equal, symmetrical, simultaneous and balanced mastery of both realms. So as long as all writers have black belts with loads of bands on them, and at least one PhD each, then everything should be fine. Right? This is Daniele Bolelli demonstrating the duality of the martial arts. Uh, Daniele, he was a well, one time PhD student in this department. Um, unfortunately, not. There are multiple writers of scholarly works on martial arts who, should they feel the need to do so, could claim both academic and martial arts expertise. Fortunately, most understand that it's <coughs> immodest to do so. Unfortunately, these border-crossing experts all produce very different kinds of writing to each other. This is because, just as going to a particular martial arts class will draw you into a particular kind of behavior, at least while you're there, so does academia. Hence, even experts in the same martial art, if they are working within different academic fields, will produce very different academic writing to each other even though it is on ostensibly the same subject. This is because different academic discourses each have their own distinct orientations, questions, concerns, methods, values, principles of verification, and styles. And hence, they each produce or invent their own specific disciplinary objects. The Kung Fu of film studies is not the Kung Fu of historical studies, which is not the Kung Fu of sports studies, which is not the Kung Fu of philosophy or the Kung Fu of subcultural studies. This is why any and every piece of writing viewed from any other viewpoint will always stand accused of, in my critics' words, talking about everything somehow related to martial arts besides all that matters. This is why in my own book I argued that the academic study of martial arts is always going to disappoint non-academic martial artist readers. Academic writing about martial arts is never going to be simply about martial arts. It's always going to have to be also about something else, because academic writing can never simply be about one thing. I hasten to add, the same goes for non-academic writing about them too. 
but a discussion about this would take us too far afield. The other kinds of things that academic writing about martial arts could also or ultimately be about include identity, gender, ethnicity, class, nation, history, diaspora, globalization, media, technology, ideology, religion, philosophy, physiology, treatment of injury, rehabilitation, and so on and so forth, through the disciplines and the waxing and waning of problematic structuring and restructuring each field. For many, perhaps any disciplines can accommodate studies of martial arts, but each will demand that the topic be formulated, explored, examined, and elaborated in terms of two crucial other things. First, one of that discipline's preferred problematics, and second, according to one of that discipline's methods. This is the source of the disconnectedness of academic discourses. They vanish into their own worlds. But it's also the source of their connectivity and all of their capacities. On the one hand, academic studies of martial arts or anything else become disconnected from non-academic discourses when they vanish into their field's problematics. But then this supposed disconnect is precisely the source of their capacity to reconnect. The medical or mechanical study of the knee in Tai Chi or Taekwondo, or of blood pressure or brain function, or the study of historical legislation around weapons, or political projects around street violence and so on, might all come to have the cap capacity to intervene in the real world, precisely because of their principal drift or distance away from everyday discourse. So when it comes to my book, Perhaps my critic has a point. Perhaps my kind of book is indeed striking a blow against all that he holds dear, up to and including his own claims of authority. Certainly my kind of book takes aim at much of the baggage that goes along with certain traditional ways of understanding tradition, authentic approaches to authenticity and authoritative understandings of authority, and the, associate, the associated ways of preserving these things such as in certain kinds of traditional or authentic martial arts books. <clears throat> in the same way, the methodologically rigorous studies of Taekwondo and other martial arts could come to interrupt, disrupt, or disturb nationalistic discourses, if not at their points of production or popular reception, then at least in their academic moments and locations. At the very least, such academic studies stand in stark contrast to the touristic, orientalist versions of martial arts histories and cultures and their smooth deployment in ethno-nationalist ideological fantasies, both of which trade in emotive evocations of tradition and authenticity. It's in this way that I would most hope that the work of both me and my office nerd colleagues could indeed deliver the next big blow to authentic traditional martial arts. For the authentic and traditional in this formulation seem to be valuable only to the extent that they remain mystified and occulted and controlled by masters with secret and ultimate and enigmatic mysterious knowledge. This kind of knowledge is snake oil and shark fin or rhino horn and tiger penis. All such things are precious of course and precisely because they are precious they should not be consumed and I invite any who disagree with me to try to kick me off my horse. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's me.